So, hello everyone, this is Tanith here. Um, got a really exciting guest for us today. I'm going to introduce you to, in a minute to, um, to Lisa Smith, who is a nutritionist, amongst other things. Um, I've known Lisa for a couple of years. I met her um, at an organisation with her other hat, and she's um, helped me out in the past, and we've worked together. So I'm going to introduce Lisa and let her tell you a little bit more about herself. So, hello, Lisa. Hello there, Tanith. How are you? Yeah, yeah, really well, thank you. Really well. So do you just want to give us a little bit of um, background about yourself, please? Yeah, certainly. Um, I qualified as a nutritionist about 2005 um, and since then I've worked quite closely under the umbrella of Dr Marilyn Glenville, who uh, some of you may know recognised as one of the UK's leading nutritionists specialising in women's health care. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that I'm exclusively female in the work that I do. Right. I also work in private practice um, in Kent and again up in London. Yep. And that's, I, I deal with sort of most things there. But I suppose a lot of the things that I deal with are to do with the, the full hormone system of the body, whether that be reproductive hormones or whether it be the stress hormones or whether it be things like insulin or the thyroid. Right, wow. Um and I know um, I've, I've seen you now as a client as well, um, and mm-hmm. I've talked to you about the menopause and because that's see what my interest is and that's what I'm going through myself. So this is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So I've just got a few questions we'll kind of go through. I'm sure there'll be other stuff that will come come out as as we go through. So is it okay if we just go through these questions I've got? Right. Yeah. Brilliant. So just to keep it simple to start with, I just want to know, I just want to talk about what, how you would describe what the actual, you know, what is the menopause and kind of what happens to a woman's body as we kind of go through those changes? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think one of the things I always want to stress to people is the menopause is a natural event. It's not something that demands medical attention. Right. There is some sort of thought that, you know, it's actually a condition caused by falling hormone levels. And therefore, um, sometimes from the medical profession side, it's something that needs curing, i.e. put HRT in. And while at times, you know, there is the necessity for that. If you look at sort of the Far East, they, they don't actually, they don't experience the menopause. They don't have the symptoms that we have in the sort of developed Western world. But if you look at the, the standard monthly cycle, it, it's governed by a number of hormones. Yeah. And early on, each woman has a supply of X. It's approximately about 2 million from the moment she's born. And obviously over the years, um, as women age, these die off, we use them in the monthly cycle, etc. And eventually those stores are depleted. Right. And it's then that the body will start with these hormonal changes to actually adapt to that. So as the ovaries reduce the production of estrogen, which is one of the main hormones, um, the menstrual cycle will become less and less because without the estrogen we don't produce the progesterone right and eventually the menstrual cycle stops completely Mm -hmm. now one of the issues that we have you've got this sort of definition between the 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 pre-menopause the perimenopause as it's called and the post-menopause right and so to the perimenopause, this is a grey area because this is when the function of the ovaries is declining, mm-hmm. but there is still a menstrual cycle, but it might be irregular and then we start getting with symptoms that can go quite extreme, can be quite... quite okay. And really the menopause can only be diagnosed after, it's sort of retrospectively, after there's been an absence of period for depending on the age. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so that's that. So the perimenopause, and and that's when we're experiencing the hot flushes and the sweats, and and that's and the irregular periods and the change of uh, flow of the period. That's what kind of happens. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you often get what's called estrogen dominance then, because progesterone will be the first reproductive hormone that starts to fall. And obviously, estrogen dominance is always associated with your, if I put in inverted commas, PMS symptoms. Right. So it could be the moodiness, the disturbed sleep, the, you know, the changes in body temperature, bloating, all of those sort of things start, but intermittently and erratically. Okay. Um, 
so going, going back to the hot flushes because this is the one thing that most people uh, put with the menopause is the hot flush and there, there are two different types aren't there of kind of hot flushes isn't there more like a, 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 a well, do you want to explain what they are this and this is sort of one thing that can um distinguish between when you're looking at these symptoms it's really key to get the difference between these because if it is actually a sweat i.e somebody wakes up in the night and classically they are already you know sweating dripping wet quite round the back of the neck underneath the breast that is a classic menopausal sweat and it's the body trying to cope with any sudden fluctuations in hormones right. now this should be a transitional period mm -hmm. it really shouldn't last long term and when i see a lot of folks i'm talking to them they'll be mentioning these menopausal flushes you know i've oh, been having them for years mm. and when you talk to them in fact what they're getting is an inner rising heat yeah so pretty much starting in the abdomen and coming up and almost like a wave of heat coming over them right. now that's completely different um when the ovaries actually um stop producing estrogen mm. the area of the body that has to compensate for this um uh, because we need a little bit of estrogen to protect against osteoporosis and heart disease when we, when we are postmenopausal right it's called the, the adrenal glands and the adrenal glands actually deal with stress they help us cope on a day-to-day -day basis mm. So it's really important that immediately prior to the menopause, the actual adrenal glands are healthy. And this is where a lot of issues arise because ladies enter the menopause stressed, basically. You know, they've had demanding jobs, got families, mm -hmm. etc. And quite often, um, at this stage, they've not really looked after themselves. They put themselves at the bottom of the list where priorities are concerned. Yeah. This inner rising heat whilst it was triggered by the menopausal hormone fluctuations that would have just resulted in the sweat this inner rising heat as a result of the adrenal glands not being able to cope with the additional workload that's now being asked of them and people often say to me yes but if i have when i, when I put the hrt in these sweats or this inner heat goes mm -hmm will do because the, the adrenal glands are no longer being asked to work harder right okay yeah HRT. so it, it's often seen that people say i'm still having these menopausal sweats now i've got ladies in their 60s saying it and you know really no it's not a menopausal sweat mm. it was triggered these flushes were triggered by the menopause but they're now being sustained and driven by the adrenal glands mm. and i think that's what i get now that's because i've been mm. now we were talking about this i um i've been quite i've been when i do get these hot flushes i'm trying you know i really kind of concentrate and thought what they felt like and it is that inner heat rising and then it suddenly comes over me but i don't i don't get really get the um the sweat so yeah, yeah that's interesting and, and what happens is that they're often after some sort of stressful event now, if you think, of, let's redefine stress as anything that needs an emotional, mental, and physical adjustment by the body. So it might be after a cup of a hot drink, a cup of tea. It might be getting out of the bath. It can literally be getting up in the morning. Anything that's going to put pressure on the body, mm. make it work harder, dependent how tired your adrenal glands are, can trigger this mm. in a Heat, this, this rising, it might be an irritating phone call, slamming your brakes on in the car. Right. It's yeah, yeah. You, put, you want the pressure to temporarily, after that, you will get this surge coming up. So once you, you know, the, if there's ways of dealing with obviously the external stresses and looking after your adrenals, then that would then reduce the stress on the yeah. adrenals and then these flushes would, would um, well, disappear, I guess. That's it. You just need to be looking as well as looking at the key support to deal with the hormonal fluctuations you also need some support in to help the body the, the adrenal glands are going to have to work harder now mm. so they need some extra nourishment some extra support in there because is, is it true that the, the adrenals are actually trying to pr produce more of the sex hormones when the ovaries aren't producing is that yeah, right yeah that's the thing they take over the production of mm. estrogen so they're stressed in that way as well isn't it Ad additional stress <laughs> Yeah, but the other thing is the adrenal glands um, in women can also produce some testosterone. Right. Now, this is when we can sometimes start seeing these, well, you know, the, the classic is the facial hair. Mm. 
mm. the hair sprouting out on the chin because um, if you're asking these adrenal glands, and if they're constantly being triggered by, and really they're being triggered by things that shouldn't be a stress by the body. They're only being seen as a stress because the body isn't working optimally. Right. You know, it's a bit of pressure. Mm. But obviously you can then get an imbalance of testosterone and it's looking at the ratio of um, the hormones, including testosterone. And most people see that as the, the male hormone. Mm. But mm. females, we all, have a, we all have some. And testosterone is strength and stamina. We do need some, especially post-menopause. We want to maintain that muscle definition. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but of okay. course, if we get an imbalance of that, this is when we can start seeing these, you know, sort of the excess facial hair coming in. Because uh -huh. it can be driven by this stress. And it can also be driven um, by the liver. Um, and, and the diet, but we'll maybe touch on that in one of your questions later. Yeah, that is one of my questions, but we'll we'll go on to that. So, so moving on from that, because I know because these are all related. These questions. Yeah. We're going to talk about the blood sugar levels, um, and you know why it's important. It's important for everyone, isn't it, to keep them balanced? But particularly, I think for menopausal women. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if you think of. Um, blood sugar, the glucose, that's, it's our chosen fuel. That's what we run from. It's like the petrol in the car. Yeah. And obviously, you need a constant supply going in to just maintain your energy throughout the day to stop these ups and downs. I mean, classically, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning, 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Again, that's sort of the munchies, as I say. You know, you want something sweet, something to, to pep you up and keep you going. And the reason that you get that, you know, any time you get a sugar craving, a hunger pain, it's your body telling you it's running out of fuel. And it's almost like your petrol light, your emergency petrol light coming on in the car. Yeah. But at the same extent, if you're getting to that stage, it's almost too late. Mm -hmm. You've already got these low blood sugar levels. And the issue with this is the um, A, from an energy point of view, but also glucose um, can, or lack of glucose, low blood sugar levels will trigger the production of the stress hormones. Right. So we're going to put in pressure on the adrenal glands. Right. The problem is then is we often go for the wrong foods. I mean, there's never a craving for broccoli. It's always <laughs> going to be it's always going to be, you know, chocolate, coffee, tea, something that can will either trigger the release of glucose or put glucose into the body. Mm. And then the problem we get with that is the body needs to control that glucose and it produces insulin. Mm. And insulin in the right levels is great, but if we get an overproduction of insulin, this then interferes with the production of something called sex hormone binding globule in the liver. Right. And sex hormone binding globule attaches itself to testosterone and takes it out of the body. Oh. We need it with a bit of a double whammy. What we've got now is we're not producing the regulatory hormone to control the testosterone, and we're actually producing more testosterone. Okay. And we're out of balance. So um, you, you can actually get this ratio between estrogen and testosterone, you know, widens. We've got any that's going up and down, we're dipping, um, we're getting sort of cravings for the wrong sorts of foods and obviously mm. there is going to be natural tendency, and this is a bit that most people don't like to hear, it is quite natural when you go through the menopause to put on about six or seven pounds in weight. Right. And what we want to do is make sure that that weight goes on a little bit all over the body and not specifically around the middle where it's the bad fat. Yeah. We get around the middle because if it does, that impacts on health. Yeah. And if we buy it high in sugar, that's where the weight goes. And that seems to be the common um, complaint of women that are uh, getting older and, and, you know, going through the menopause. It seems to be the belly fat. That's the one thing that, you know, everyone says they lose their waist. Mm -hmm. It's that area, isn't it, that they worry yeah. about. Yeah, and that is the one you have to control your blood sugar levels because then by doing that, it can help to take the pressure off the adrenal so we haven't got these hot sweats, etc. But also it makes sure that the body uses 
the sugars and the food you're eating in the right way. And every time you eat something, the body's got a decision to make. Is it going to use that food and glucose as energy, or will it store it as fat? Mm -hmm. Now, if you eat in the presence of the stress hormones, um, you eat secondary activity, if you eat a lot of sugar, or you're eating high glucose foods, mm -hmm. the body cannot cope with the load of the, the glucose going in. It will be stored as fat. Right, okay. It, not because as it's, it's, if you put, I would say it's a bit like going to the sink with a tap, uh, with a cup. And if you turn the tap on full, mm. and then turn the tap off, you've only got half a cup of water because the other half bounced out. That's right. what happens if we don't eat balanced foods. All of the food goes in, so all of the sugar goes in, but the body has to then take out the excess and store it as fat. And the way that we store extra um, glucose and calories, unfortunately, is in adipose fat cells, and in females, they're around the waist. Right, and um, and also to, uh, the uh, the fat. The reason that we put fat on, isn't it, because it. <laughs> The fat cells produce estrogen, don't they? So they produce one of the um, estrogens for us, as, and that's important as we're getting older. So our body's almost kind of we're almost trying to fight our natural body's uh, but, reaction, aren't we? And if you think if the adrenal glands are trying to produce some of this estrogen, if they are stressed and they are not producing it, the body will naturally lay down some fat to right. produce normal. So it's really important to keep get the adrenal glands healthy. Yeah over the production to prevent the body and it's a mechanism it's a survival mechanism the body knows we need that little bit of estrogen to protect, protect against heart disease and osteoporosis yeah. so it's easy to do it and it's whether it does it predominantly by the adrenal glands or predominantly by the fat cells so to, just just going on because the big thing is that you know people always worry about the, the weight that they seem to put on and is it just about reducing the amount of starchy carbs is it, is it kind of that simple or or should they um should people be looking at their stress and and their lifestyle as well if, 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 if they've got to go hand in yeah, hand to be honest absolutely. yes a well-balanced diet is essential during the menopause because it will help the body just automatically and naturally to these type of hormonal changes. Yeah. And that's, you know, we, that's one of the first things we said, that you've got to get the sugar out. The white, you know, I said it's white, don't bite. Yeah. The, exception, the exception is oats because they, they are good. But, you know, this white bread, white rice, they've got to be replaced and it's the starchy carbohydrates that cause the problem. Mm. Um, but yeah, you replace all the, the processed and refined carbohydrates, anything with white flour, white rice, but you put in the whole grain, put the brown in. Yeah. Put the, and also think of some of those other grains, you know, there's quinoa, milk, mm. there's wine, and these are all really good grains compared to the processed yeah. white meat rice based products that are out there. Yeah. Um, and another, another key thing is making sure that people get enough of the essential fats. Okay. And this is predominantly we're looking at oily fish here. Mm -hmm. We're an island and we, we are notoriously bad at um, eating oily fats. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, need, you need this, particularly in the menopause, because we lose some of the natural lubrication that we would get from the, the hormones. Now, this can be in the joint, in the skin as well as vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. It is something that people do not mention, but if you're going through the menopause, you've gone through it, it's always a consideration. So, and, you know, the, these membranes need the big fats, they need the omega-3, but it's making sure that those in there as what, well. What dosage would you recommend then for, um, or is that hard for you to say, of the, of the, um, the, the fish oils? And you need to... You need to look at the fish oil and what you need to be um, studying is what's called the EPA and DHA levels. Okay. So you'll have a fish oil, it might say a thousand milligrams of fish oil, mm -hmm. turn it round, look at the back, EPA and DHA because they are the active forms that the body wants. Right. And ideally you want a minimum of a gram of those two added together. Okay. Uh, it, you know, if you're saying you can get some, you know, supplements. Uh, they might say a thousand milligram of omega three, but when you turn it over, they might be only two hundred and fifty milligrams of the active DHA and EPA. Oh, okay, so that's interesting. Yeah. 
really look and turn that package around and how much EPA and DHA are there. Ideally, you want those two to add up to over a gram. Right. Okay, that's really interesting because um, I I didn't I didn't know the the uh, significance of that. So that's I've definitely learned mm -hmm. something there. Um, I think also it's worth mentioning is it with um with the with the weight gain you you mentioned earlier that you know we ca can generally put on six to seven pounds you know average weight gain. Um, can we lose that again? Is it possible to lose that? <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean you, you can control it certainly, but I think what I learned another bit of bad news here is. <laughs> Because we lose the testosterone, mm. um, and testosterone is, you know, it's strength, it's stamina, as I said, it's been, you know, with the muscles, we actually lose a little bit of muscle tone. Right. And what happens, you sort of, you put on the six pounds of fat, and you lose some of your muscle definition. Right. Now, muscles are biologically much more active than fat. So if you take a pound of muscle, it will burn off 75 calories a day. Mm -hmm. If you take a pound of fat, it will burn off eight. Right. So if you go through the menopause, you eat the same and you do the same exercise, you will still gain weight because your metabolism has automatically slowed down. Right. So through the menopause, it is absolutely essential you do weight-bearing exercise. Yeah. It eats against osteoporosis as well. Yeah. Okay. But you need to keep those muscles metabolically active. You need to keep that muscle um, density where you can so you've got that definition. And that's why weight training and using weight is really important. Right, when yeah, absolutely. Weight. Yeah, and okay. also it helps the um, it helps keep your shape as well, doesn't it? Cause it'll... Absolutely, yes. yeah. Because otherwise, as I say, you can do you can do absolutely everything the same, mm. and unfortunately, still you will still gain weight just because your metabolism will have slowed down slightly. And um, and also, I think you know, at this time, you know, it's, we need a bit of patience because it doesn't happen fast. <laughs> you know, it's not like being in your thirties where you could have quite quick results by changing your diet and yeah. doing some different training. You know, when you're hitting, uh, when we're getting older, it's much slower, isn't it? It is, yeah, and it needs to be consistent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, um, just moving on. The next exercise, um, um, sorry, and a uh, question was going to be about energy. Um, I get a lot of questions about women, they're feeling very tired, I guess because the hormonal fluctuations and, and, and whatever else they're going through. It's, what can they do to help with their energy levels, Lisa? I mean, to be honest, we are back to the same thing, getting yeah. those levels balance yeah. because if your body thinks it's running out of energy and you bring low blood sugar, it's automatically going to try and conserve energy. Yeah. And that's what you know, your petrol lights come in the car, you start chugging a bit, coming out, you know, a bit sluggish, the mood often goes as well. Mm. With a low energy can come that little bit of irritability yeah. that can build with it. Um a bit sort of foggy thinking. And it is maintaining those um, blood sugar levels by eating a balanced diet that includes the whole grains, lots, we want lots of leafy greens and we want lots of legumes in there as well. Uh, as a, you know, the Western world, we're a little bit scared of beans and legumes. <laughs> and have to come out of we're not really sure what to what do, to do with, them. with them. No, strange bags <laughs> that always stay to be in the back of your cupboard somewhere, don't they? <laughs> you know, we haven't got that... Um, sort of history of using like they have in the Far East or the Middle East with you know, little, oh, let's just make some beans on toast with them. Mm. And the thing about beans and lentils and like they're brilliant because they help to produce SHBG. So we're back to the fact they help to control the hormones as well. They're low calorie. They're naturally balanced in carbohydrates and protein and they're low in sugar. Right. Brilliant. These yeah. are the reasons you need to be starting to look to put in. Um, and introduce those into the meals because also they're quite thinned. So, you, you know, you're going to get that feeling of fullness and so they can start replacing things like the starchy carbohydrates. Mm, mm. You, can, you get more protein from them, you're going to get a, 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 more, a constant energy supply from them 
and they're going to help with the hormones. Okay. Um, talking about protein, protein, because we had an interesting conversation about this the other day. Um, we went through my um, eating and I was really surprised that I don't eat enough protein. Um, so what's the recommendation again for protein, just so women have got a bit of, a bit of an idea what it's they should be aiming for? No, you need your calculator out on this one. It's, oh. it's a, like, 0.8 of a gram of protein yep. for every kilogram of body weight. So, so it out. So 0.8 for every kilogram. Okay. So if you're about 45, 50, so about 50, 60 kilograms, you need around 40 to 45 grams of protein. Okay. Okay. Now, that's great saying that, but that's people just going, well, yeah, what does, what does that, that mean? mean? Yeah. yeah. Does that mean in reality? Well, if you look at a chicken breast, yep. that's going to give you about 20 grams of protein. Three eggs, medium size eggs, will give you about 20 grams of protein. Okay, yeah. So when we, the issue is when we start looking at people say, oh, yeah, but things like brown rice has got protein in. They're right, it has, but then it's the volume of the protein you need to eat. You need to eat about 350 grams of brown rice to get a 20 gram serving of protein. <laughs> That's a lot of rice. That's a lot of carbs. <laughs> this is it. And this is when you've got to look at getting, you know, the, the, the sort of the quality of the protein is really important because we don't want lots of the, the, the bad fats. And if we think of bad fat being solid at room temperature, right. A, they're calorific, but B, they stop the good fats from working. And we need those good fat, fats to keep the lubrication in the joints, the skin, etc. Okay, that's brilliant. Yeah, we want to be looking at the protein. We, yes, we still want the fish and the oily fish, great, mm. double honey, protein and omega 3s, fantastic. Um, you know, so we've got the fish, the oily fish in there. But then we need to be looking at things like quinoa, tofu, chicken, the lean meat, even some game. I mean, I'm, I'm not a red meat eater, but I'll occasionally have game. Generally speaking, the animals, they're leaner by nature because they've been left out there, you know, yeah. naturally running about. Yeah. They're not intensively farmed, so they haven't got all the, the hormones and the um, antibiotics pumped into them. So yeah. again, okay. That's fine, mm. but it, it really is making sure that the protein is there because protein is cell renewal, it's cell repair. Every yeah. cell in your body is made up of protein, and if you're not getting quite enough, I'm not saying the protein deficiency. I'm just saying a little bit below what you need. It's your hair, skin, and nails that will suffer. Right, interesting. And also another point: it's uh, it keeps its uh, satisfaction, doesn't it? It keeps you fuller for longer as well. <laughs> That's why. You always need to eat protein every time you eat. I say to my patients, you say, where's my fruit and vegetables and where's my protein? Yeah. Because the protein will slow down the sugar release into the body, which means we don't get the high. If we don't get the high, we don't get, get the subsequent low. Oh, brilliant. So we yeah. not nice and balanced. Okay, that's lovely. Um, well, so I've got a couple more questions. Um, you briefly mentioned earlier estrogen dominance um, as opposed to low estrogen. Um, you know, can you just kind of um, explain what the difference is between that? Really, there's, there's um, low estrogen. If you're looking at the menopause, first of all, progesterone is the, 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 the you've got your two hormones, you've got estrogen and progesterone, and they're the main two that people associate with the menstrual cycle. Yeah. You've then got what we call your FSH and LH, but let's just concentrate yeah. on estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is produced um, sort of throughout the cycle at varying levels, where progesterone is predominantly reduced after ovulation. Therefore, when you enter the menopause, you're not ovulating, so yep. then you don't produce um, progesterone. So this is the estrogen dominance that we see first of all. Right. It's because of the progesterone. It doesn't mean you've got too much estrogen. It just means progesterone is falling first. Oh, uh, okay, yep. The symptoms. But then eventually, estrogen falls as well. And it's when we get the low estrogen... Um, that we start with the that you know that is a menopause then because that's we've lost both hormones right okay so estrogen dominance would that be more perimenopausal then yeah, you tend that's more estrogen dominance you can even get with a regular menstrual cycle if you've got pms right okay then, yeah then you've got estrogen um dominance so estrogen dominance it's just 
it's the ratio between hormones that's important. They okay. can both be high, but if the ratio's okay, they're fine. They can both be low if the ratio's okay. Obviously, when we see no estrogen, you know, when we get very limited estrogen like in the menopause, then yes, unfortunately, there are the symptoms, you know, and we've, we've touched on some. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's the nerves, that's the mood swings, decline in libido, the skin, the lack of energy, the joint pains, and it, it, it's managing that. Yeah. A lot of that can come on suddenly when the sudden drop, sudden fluctuation in the event. And right. that's why we need to get the balance right to help protect the body against that. Okay. Um couple more questions then. You briefly mentioned hair earlier and I do get asked quite a lot this, how come we kind of suddenly sprout hair in strange places, you know, on our chins and stuff. So is there anything that women can do about that? Because it seems to be um, quite a hot topic actually. Yeah. Well, the, the, the main two things we've already touched on is one, control the stress. Yeah because the stress will increase the testosterone production. Yep. And make sure that we're supporting the liver, that we're eating balance to get these beans and legumes and the things that can help to produce this SHBG, sex right. hormone binding globule, that will help to control the excess testosterone. Right, okay. And we're looking at the ratio between estrogen and testosterone. Okay. It's coming from, but if you are stressed, you know, and it, it's constantly, you're stressing your body, you're making it work hard, those adrenal glands will produce testosterone. Okay. So we then get a slight build-up in testosterone. Even though we've lost some, it's in ratio, remember. Right. We've, we had a little bit of testosterone, we will lose some. We had a massive amount of estrogen, mm. and we've lost it. So it becomes a ratio then between testosterone and estrogen and if you get that slightly higher in favor of testosterone it's male traits and some people can even they can get say the chin hair but then they'll almost look as if they're getting male trait baldness pattern wow. so you can get those two bits you know yeah. in the forehead they'll look as if they're losing hair there and that's when there is a very high testosterone it's not common no. Stop panicking. No. <laughs> yeah. God, the fear of causing everyone. <laughs> now just going to produce a bit more testosterone. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. It's important to, to get these controlled. Yeah. You know, going back over just what we've spoken about, it all comes down to stress, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, a lot of it. Yeah. And, and this, you know, if you look at um, things like the menopause, we've seen far more extremes in symptoms than we did say years ago yeah yeah as said, the far east the middle east they don't suffer from it but we have to look at the lifestyle here yes. we live in a want it all um century you know women can have it all we can do everything we've got the family we work and it's great but we have to get it in balance mm -hmm. when you look at the far east the middle east they still very much have traditional roles there and if you look back to 50 years ago in the uk it would have been a more what we call a traditional role that a high percentage of the females of menopausal age would be at home. Mm. They wouldn't be working. Yeah. And it is that with in the last hundred years, you know, we've had a massive change in lifestyle, but unfortunately the body hasn't quite caught up no. yet. No. Okay. And we've missing all these extra demands on the body that we just need some extra support if we're going to do that. Okay. Um, I want to talk about postmenopause as well. So you're talking women who are getting older, so if they're getting you know to later fifties and, and onwards, um, all these symptoms that we've spoken about, they all just calm down, don't they? And your body, I guess, the body just adjusts. Um, but what? what it, go on. Well, yeah, a lot of the time, these main symptoms are due to these sudden drops in hormones. Right. You know, they don't drop nicely. Things can impact on you. Get sudden drops after them. Um, but in effect, you know, the body will not be metabolically quite as active as it was. And so, yeah, we, we, are let, we do have to take care and make sure that we don't get some of these um, residual symptoms. You know, the skin unfortunately does go a bit drier, so we then have to make sure we're looking after it. And we're getting things in there to help to make sure that doesn't become a problem. Right, okay. Um Talking about dryness, 
We um mm-hmm. when I spoke to you the other day, we, you were saying about and you said about um was it vitamin vitamin E capsules that could be um inserted capsules. into the gym? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, vitamin E capsules. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, vaginal dryness, it's not mentioned, but it is so common. Yeah. It's so to hear about it such a lot. And yeah, there is um, a vitamin E. Am I allowed to mention the company? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, give us a brand because it has to be a specific yeah, type, doesn't it? Yeah, Solgar. Right. And it's a specific one. It's a vitamin E 400 IU soft gel capsule. Okay. Now, it must be the soft gel capsule. Solgar, Solgar also do another vitamin E 400 IU, but that's the standard one. Okay. It's sent on the front, vitamin E 400 IU soft gel capsule. And you just use that as a pessary on the evenings intercourse isn't taking place because then you're putting the, the moisture where it's needed okay. yeah. you know, to improve the integrity of those membranes. So that helps with any soreness, any dryness, okay. stop you know, the prevention of any thrush as well that some people can get because of the, the integrity gets compromised. Mm. Uh, talk about thrush, you also mentioned, it. did you say about you can put probiotics doing the same thing? Was that... You can, yes, if, if you're suffering from thrush, there's a, a product called BioCult. Um, BioCult is um, again a very clean probiotic and if somebody is prone to thrush, then yes, on alternate nights with the vitamin E, um, again, as long as intercourse isn't taking place, you can use a, a biocorp as a pessary to put the bacteria where it's actually needed. Yeah. It's, it's usually an imbalance. These mucous membranes contain the good bacteria, and when they become compromised, we haven't got sufficient um, good bacteria levels to control the, the, the you know, thrush is usually called by the candida yeast to control. Right. Okay, that's brilliant. That's just, just yeah. I mean, I've I've got loads of it um, out for this conversation we've had today. Um, I mean, we could talk for ages, but <laughs> I think I'm gonna um, I think I'm gonna kind of kind of wind up the interview there. Um, you've been really really helpful. Um, I think it's been a little bit of a bad line um, through some of it. Um, so I'm gonna see how the recording is. But I just, okay. want to, just want to say thank you very much. Is there anything you'd like to mention or, um, about where people may be able to find out more about you, about what you do? Yes, certainly. Um, I've got a website they can go to, which is www.nutriology.co.uk. Brilliant. Um, I've got all my contact details on there. Um, alternatively, if they want to give me a ring, it's 01892. Eight nine one three seven nine. I'm quite happy to answer questions, point people in the right direction. But if it, they want sort of specifics about them as an individual, mm-hmm. then by all means come over and, and you know and see me. There is such a lot that can be done, and we don't have to suffer. It yeah. isn't some. That we, and I might just add that I'm postmenopausal, so when I'm talking about these things, I am speaking from experience. Absolutely. And just quickly before you go, um, I know you you deal with herbs as well, and you do um, help women a lot of the herbs, and that that sometimes is a solution to help some women as well, isn't it? An alternative. Yeah. yeah. And the one thing I would say about herbs is a lot of the time herbs herbs work better synergistically when they're in a blend. But key ones, if you're looking at the menopause, um, you've got black cohosh. Yep. Uh, that's one that's very good at helping against the flushes and maintaining those, uh, the mucous membranes. Um, Agnes castor. Yep. That helps, that helps when you're going through the menopause. It works with the pituitary glands. It helps to stimulate and normalize so that these hormones drop in a more balanced way. Okay. That you've got Dong Kwai, yep. gem tonic for the female reproductive system, and again helps with the hot flushes, the vaginal dryness. Red sage, flushes. That's for the sweats. When you get in those real sort of sweats, that yeah. will come in and support. And a really important one, milk thistle. Yeah. We need we need to have a good liver because we need the liver. To actually, you know, it's, we all know it detoxifies, but it also detoxifies hormones mm. out of the body. Mm. So when the body's trying to get rid of these hormones, it's the liver that does that. And if you can't do it properly, they'll get recycled. So mm. we need the liver. It protects the liver cells against damage and promotes the healing of any damaged cells. 
So it improves that general function of the liver. Yeah. And any combination of those, and some really good ones out there, whether in tincture or capsule form, can be a great help going through the menopause. Um, maybe, maybe what you could do is maybe put together just a couple of recommendations for us of um, maybe some good suppliers of the herbs, because I just think you've got to be so careful, haven't you, with, with rather than just... Yeah. Uh, dropping into you know uh, a supplement shop and just picking up a handful of of um, herbs I mean you could do more damage than good couldn't you oh yeah there are a lot out there that are just not going to do anything yeah. you know they're, they're just not the right quality they're not at the right level yeah they, they you tend to need a, a specific um the, you know there are there's good ones out there but unfortunately they're not necessarily in the likes of boots or holly no. and barris no absolutely marketed to the mass market they're not the quality and they're not going to have the impact that no. the, the, the really good ones will okay well that's lovely well we'll leave it there because it's been uh it's been 40 minutes so um <laughs> it's been quite a long interview but there's so much you've given us and so much information that i think everyone's going to be able to use and i just want to say thank you very much and um and i'll well, we'll talk again very soon yeah that would be great thank you take care cheers bye Bye.